I'm a quantitative person involved in my field, but I came across way more qualitative papers than quantitative papers. So my meta-analysis was this big, and I had this ginormous stack of qualitative work that I needed to go through. And so I asked one of my professors, well, how do we evaluate qualitative research? What's the good and the bad? I don't know how to sort them. And so he says, well, nothing exists, so let's do it. So that's where, this is the beginning of that. So we wanted to look at what the research says about evaluating qualitative research. What are education specific people saying is good, bad, ugly, those sorts of things. And this strategy took us through hundreds, literally hundreds of articles. And so we finally came down to 26 that focused on education and told us what we should look for in evaluating an article. Lots of reading, lots of sorting. And we did this OCR means that if you have a document, a PDF, and you can't highlight it, that means it's not OCR. So we had to go through Adobe and make sure that we can do that and pull out the text that we wanted to look at. So initially, I wanted to see what's even going on. So Textalizer, you just copy and paste all of the text in there, and it tells you how many sentences, how many words, all of these really cool things. And what I cared about was for education researchers, our goal is not to talk to other researchers. Our goal is to talk to teachers, talk to admin, talk to students, parents. And so in Textalizer, unfortunately, these articles are very difficult to read. So you can see from this bottom, readability, 100 is easy, 20 hard. It's right at that very difficult stage. And so that was just an initial look at what are we getting from all these articles? And it seems like a lot of jargon, a lot of scientific mumbo jumbo, uh, which we then dived into. So I did, initially before this slide, all of this was put into in vivo, which I'm not gonna show here because it's a little, it's a little bit of a monster. It's kind of hard to get into initially. But what in vivo does, it allows you to search based on what words you think are interesting. If I could search for my name, it would tell me how many times those popped up in all 26 is really neat. And what I did instead was to tell, have it tell me what came up the most. And so what we found, the top 20 had about 10 that were really important. So that's what these are in this bubble, in this bubble chart, which I'll go into in a second. So what are the things that they care about the most, we would hope would be the most frequent. And then on the right is each one of those 26 articles and how those relate to the different colors based on the bubbles. And then over time. So it started in the 80s, and we think that it would become more and more frequent, but according to our charts, not so much. And this is in Tableau. This is a data visualization software that Josh was talking about. And it is fabulous. And so from Tableau, we pulled all of the words, all of the article information, and found uh, different categories. So if I click on reporting, I can see how many articles talk about reporting standards and to what degree. So as you can see, client loves it, but a lot of them don't touch it. And then over time between all of the articles, looks like 2008 is a big one. But it changes depending on which category you're in. So almost everybody cares about this. Even fewer care about subjectivity and talking about qualitative research. So through Tableau, we were able to see which articles care about which topics, which topics were generally more important, and then how this changes over time. So these are the top, I think it was 10, and this size indicates how frequently they were mentioned. And my favorite thing about Tableau is that I can just look at a few of them, the ones that I think are important. So I think theory is very important to talk about when evaluating research, but, but I'm alone in that. That's, <laughs> that's the red line, right? It's at the bottom, it's not very hot or a topic, right? And then, but if we compare it to data, it depends on the year, but it's, it's a lot more popular. So this is something that we were able to do in Tableau. And we can also see according to which articles, which ones care about theory more than others, and there is a scroll bar, but you can't, I'm not in Tableau, but you can see them 
by each article and pull those out. And then in in vivo, it will pull the references. It will take me exactly to where it's talking about theory and I can go dive into that, which is fun. And even more important, so a lot of our research in education, it changes. We have a lot of reforms happening. And so if I only wanted to look at the past 10 years, like I'm doing here on the side, it says, if I only want to look at the past 10, here's what the past 10 are saying about these things. So Tableau allows us to look at it year by year in that way too. And this was something that came up. We had 26 articles and the biggest names in our field when talking about evaluating qualitative research are Lincoln and Guba. And so we got to see how many times they were referenced without pouring over all of their reference lists and seeing how many times they're cited. And so that was another key piece. We're not ignoring Lincoln and Guba just because they're not in our batch. Lincoln and Guba are woven within all of our articles here. So that's the main gist of my presentation today. I would gladly take questions. Yes? So what do you do now with them? That's a great question. <laughs> what we are doing now is we are, we have created basically a checklist from this. This is what people are saying are important. These are how they define them. So we can create an education specific checklist from, from the scholars of the field. So that's where we're going first. And then we're gonna try it out second to see if it actually works with the latest research on qualitative education stuff. Great. Yes, I may have missed it. Oh. So number one, what was the actual topic? And then number two, um, why did you pick 26 out of the 723? Mm -hmm. so or, how, or how did you pick this, the, the, the 26? Right, so we started with 700, mm -hmm. but it turns out that a lot of them are either evaluating mixed methods research, which is not the same. Mm -hmm. Some people try to act like it's the same. And then some of them were repeats, so we came out duplicates. And then a lot of them, which we found out, are in nursing. Nursing's a big field, engineering's a big field, and we weren't so interested in them. So we just pulled out all the education. Later on, that's another project we might do to see what's nursing say about evaluating? How does it compare with education? So that's that. And then the overall topic is how do education researchers talk about evaluating qualitative research? So that's the topic that you did the seminar? Yes. Oh, no, go ahead. After you. Oh, Lisa, what, did you, what did you not see that you thought you might see? Is, was there anything that, that didn't show up that you were expecting? Were you expecting a greater number of um, terms, you know, <coughs> how, you know, terms describing how they were evaluating or, you know, what? I think what was most surprising to me was less of a here's how to evaluate and more of a, here's what journals are looking for. So there's a distinction there. We're talking to scholars on, we have requirements for you. We need you to hit this many things in your method and not necessarily training the next generation of people. So that was a surprising finding. Interesting. And how, how might you, have, have you thought about taking it to the, to the journal editor board level and talking to them about that? I mean, I, that, that, I'm I mean, scared for it, but that was a good idea. <laughs> well, no, I meant in terms of analyzing how are the journals shaping, I mean, the idea that these journals and the editorial boards are shaping what's out there, and, you know, what should, you know, is that a good, bad, or a different thing? Right, I think their objective is completely different than our objective. So I would love to, I would love to make a distinction between the two. Um, especially for, I'm a doc student, I didn't know how to evaluate the quality of research, and I'm in my fourth year. So this is a conversation that needs to be happening, but it's not happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would love to talk to them about their thoughts on, if we are to be publishers, that's one thing, but we also need to be evaluators <coughs> first. Mm -hmm. so, great, great point. Rachel, my question is, I want, first I want you to pretend like the dean of the libraries who funded these fellowships, pretend like he's not here, <laughs> and also pretend like Josh is not here in the room, and you can just talk frankly with the rest of us. Um, what are your, uh, what sh can you give us just a few thoughts about this program and, um, 
again, not to butter these two, but like what, how it influenced your experience or what what was great about it, what you might change about it. So I think the greatest thing for me, so I took a class on data visualization in the business school already. So I came into this thinking that I knew what I should be doing. And I didn't even know Textilizer existed. I knew in Vivo existed, I didn't know how to touch it. I didn't know how it could be used in working with Tableau. <coughs> so that was, I think, the two greatest points. Uh, they were great reference tools on, I hear what you want to do, here's how you can do it. So that was the most beneficial thing for me. And my biggest takeaway is that, unfortunately, what I thought I was going to do didn't end up being what I did, and not in a bad way, but I just didn't know where I could take it. Uh, so that was probably having one-on-one -on -one help and having experts was so helpful, because I, I knew in vivo, but I didn't know. In vivo can make charts, they look very gross. <laughs> so, you know, using the different tools in a combined way was a new thing for me. I'm from Nepal. I was born, in, born and raised in Nepal. So I'm a PhD student in the Department of Environmental Science. So prior to that, I uh, did BTEC in Environmental Engineering from Kathmandu University, that's in Nepal. And my advice here okay. is Dr. Rebecca Seasley. Uh, so in Seasley Lab, we are mostly interested in understanding the local to global impacts of atmospheric pollutants, both particulate and gases. So basically we do everything related to air pollution. Uh, so my field of interest uh, lies like within urban air quality, physics and optics of carbonaceous aerosols, and transboundary air pollution. So how did I come to know about drive summer fellowship? That's where I would like to start. So towards the end of the um, spring semester, we were looking for all the grad students in our lab were looking for opportunities to get engaged into something new um, <coughs> during summertime. So some of us were applying for uh, fellowships outside US, outside Texas, and but I was basically looking for some opportunity where I could learn more tools for data analysis. And that's where I landed, applying for Drive Sum Fellowship. So one of my other lab men, he introduced me about this uh, fellowship, and then I applied for that. I'm thankful that I got the opportunity. So we went through a lot of modules and different uh, different exercises uh, throughout this fellowship. Uh, the basic and the most important thing that um, helped me were tools for processing and analyzing data. So we learned. Tableau, we then um, we got introduced to uh, serving for surfing different state or local agency, governmental agency websites for different kind of data, um, even like UN portals for different data. I was the most seems like very small thing, but that helped me a lot was file naming convention module that we went. <laughs> So that that uh, eased out a lot of things. <laughs> and the other good thing, uh, the best tool I learned was Tableau. Mm -hmm. So I'll go through my research, what I have been doing uh, this summer until now. So my um, research is on source and ambient concentration of VOCs, that's volatile organic compounds, in San Antonio region, Texas. So. Last summer, we went to San Antonio in the Travelers World and UT uh, San Antonio. There were two sites. We measured different uh, air um, air pollutants. So we were basically University of Houston, Rice, and us uh, with different instruments. We went there and measured uh, different particulate and gases pollutants. Our basic uh, aim was to, Baylor's basic aim was to learn more about volatile organic compounds. Because volatile organic compounds, they play a major role in ozone production, which is one of the very high um, air pollutant, which has climate impacts, health impacts. So that's what our primary focus was on. And then Rice and, Bay, uh, Rice and Houston, uh, University of Houston had other instruments for other uh, speciations. 
So we ran our proton transfer reaction mass spectrometer, which does, um, which conducts the measurement of VOCs real time. That means like every second you are measuring the concentration in ambient air. So it's like uh, high resolution, a lot of data. That's what one. That's why I wanted to uh, learn more tools for analyzing data. It's like for we ran one month campaign and we had like more than. 100,000 columns of data. So we were measuring like 150 different species. So that's a big chunk of data that we're working with. Uh, so apart from VOCs, we also measured other trace gas pollutants like uh, ozone, NOx, SO2, carbon monoxides, and then uh, metallurgical parameters like wind direction, wind speed. That is now going to help us uh, figure out where the pollution is coming from and very precisely know what are the sources. So this is the mobile lab uh, that the University of Houston owns. We uh, install our, all of our instruments inside this uh, truck. And then this has like inlet system well design, power system well design, air condition. And we, we can take this anywhere we want. Even we, Baylor has uh, trailer for this, but it needs a different truck for moving it around. This is like much more compatible. So first thing I learned in this fellowship was Tableau. So I tried doing uh, a lot of data analysis using Tableau. Like I came up with a lot of different logs. Then, <laughs> then, then what happened is like I had a lot of data, a lot of columns, a lot of different species. So we then talk and then about like doing something more efficient. That's where like we sit to program. I had some. Uh, I was a bit familiar with MATLAB. That's why I didn't wanted to go with Python. Rather to choose some uh, scripting program which I know a little bit, which I don't need to start from the beginning. So that's why I went for MATLAB and the same plot, same. Uh, analysis with better hands, I could plot like better figures and find things more precisely. So this is the same. These are the same plots that I uh, plotted using MATLAB. It's more good, and then it's easier to handle, and it doesn't take a lot of time. <coughs> so I'll I'll briefly discuss like some of the results that we have seen so far. So in the Travelers World site, this was the first site where we measured, where we started measuring. If you see in this plot, the first couple of days, we have higher concentrations of acetonitrile and acid alkyl. We uh, compared all other species as well, but these two species were higher than um, the other rest of the days. So what happened actually is like, these are the two tracers for biomass burn. So we were able to identify an event of biomass burning towards the very beginning of our sampling campaign. And this time is concurrent with the time of uh, biomass burning in the Mexico side towards the curve. So we expect like this is the transboundary air pollution that's hitting San Antonio region. So now we need to, now we are like focusing into uh, using a lot of satellite-based data and then air back trajectory analysis to see like where the air particles are coming from. Whether the uh, particles that reached San Antonio that time were originated from Mexico or not. That's the uh, focus that we are having now. So, and then the other thing that we could uh, figure out only using the first few, uh, four or five days of data, which we uh, expect to be biomass burning even day, is like, uh, we correlated acid aldehyde and acid to nitrile. There's a lot of discussion whether both of these are biomass burning traces or not. A lot of scientific researchers say yes, it is. A lot of say they don't see it so any correlation. But in our study, if you see like black and the red one, like uh, dots, so red ones are the event days, and black ones are the rest of the uh, rest of the time. So we see like during the biomass burning event. Uh, the correlation was higher, about like 0 0.7. The yeah, R squared was around 0.77. Whereas during like rest of the 
uh, even the rest of the sample capital it was pretty low, around like 0.2 or something. So this we could also validate it with this data that yes, but acetonitrile and acetaldehydes are the two VOCs which can be um, taken up as biomass burning traces. And apart from that, we did um, gases measurements like for ozone and then NOx. So with that data, when we correlated with uh, some of the other VOC species, what we could see was like during higher, higher ozone uh, event days, there's another VOC called methacrolein, which is the photochemical production of one of the very known VOC isoprene. So that is also higher during higher ozone production or ozone event days. So we were able to see like um, methacrolein could be um, could be um, produced photochemically produced due to the higher ozone influence. So these are the few of the things that we are looking. And apart from this, uh, we have done some analysis on other VOCs like benzene and tauruene, which are pretty known ones. Those are like um, vehicle emission emission causes those um, those species for emission. So we could see like during rush hours, those benzene and tauruene were pretty higher. So, and that's above than what like some of the other cities in the US has reported. So we're pretty concerned about that. Apart from the measurement, uh, I have like started using uh, EPA developed a model. This is called positive matrix factorization, what it does is like, it, we just need to fit our data and tell the model like this would be the uncertainty level of our data. And then this will um, factorize it into different possible sources. So this is one of the dummy that I just started using, um, applying this, our data to this model. So this is one of the test runs. You see like there, <coughs> with the combinations, with the settings that I applied to that model, uh, it gave me like there could be six different possible sources. So with this model, I'm playing with it now um, to find the best combination which could be scientifically interpreted. So my acknowledgments are for uh, how to drive this all the fellowship thing, mostly jobs to help mm -hmm. all the way. And then um, my supervisors and my co-PI who encouraged to take up this fellowship. Zach Winfield, who introduced me to this fellowship. Thank you so much.
the num five count data that we got from the satellite, what's the government of Mexico was hiding. So, so when forests burning? Now that that is something that satellite is not able to differentiate. Gotcha. So we don't know what it was. What it was, but there were fires. Gotcha. <laughs> so, Sujan, I like that you talked about how you found this this program. Um, if you if you were in that situation, now that you're in that situation that can help advertise this to other people, what, what would you say about this program to your colleagues and, and, and peers coming after you that would, why, why would you encourage them to be a part of this? So, what I did is like, for me, it was a good option to learn different tools, not just the data analysis, but the shared data, uh, the way of reusing data. So those things, those all the grad students, they need that. And they're academic time together. So whosoever is looking for those opportunities, whosoever uh, doesn't know that as much, I'd like them to join this. At least environmental science uh, department, I I have been talking to friends who would like to apply for this. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about briefly here today is concept mapping or topic modeling as applied to sermons and anti-slavery discourses in the late 18th and early 19th century. So my uh, dissertation examines uh, the religious beliefs and practices of uh, William Wilberforce and the group of activists around him known as the Clapham Sect. Uh, this is a group that was out of Britain, uh, operating just south of London. Uh, a stone's thrown out suburb of London uh, from the halls, a uh, stone's throw from uh, Westminster uh, Palace. So, uh, roughly active between 1790 and 1830, and they're involved in a host of uh, reform causes, anti slavery, probably being the most uh, famous of them, but also uh, prison reform, women's education, uh, humane treatment of animals, opening India to missionaries. Uh, sort of a whole slew of things, which means they wrote a lot uh, if they're involved in all these causes. Uh, they wrote treatises, sermons, uh, tons and tons of correspondence, uh, which means that that is a lot of material to sort through. And so I was very interested in exploring uh, digital tools that might help in terms of quickly directing my attention to sort of nodes of their ideas, uh, thinking in terms of families of ideas. So, um, to do that, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me pause right there. There's a lot of ideas out there about how anti-slavery movements come about. And I'd like to sort of engage very briefly in a thought experiment with you. When I say, if I were to ask you what ideas propel the anti-slavery movement, why in the late 18th and early 19th century after chattel slavery had been so dominant in the Atlantic world, did people uh, begin to agitate against it? Um, what would you say? What are sort of the motifs, the themes, the words that come to mind that might frame anti-slavery discourses? Religion. What's that? Religion. Religion, yes, absolutely. Dignity. Dignity, absolutely. Human dignity. Rights. Rights, yes, the language of human rights. Quality. Quality. Yeah, fantastic. The answer is, is yes to all these. It really depended upon uh, your geographical location. It depended on your socioeconomic status. It depended upon your religious beliefs. Now, this is uh, what most historians regard as the most successful, by far, of the various anti-slavery groups out there. But uh, so much has been focused on sort of uh, speeches in parliament, mass mobilization. People have not really paid attention to the religious beliefs behind the group, nor how those religious beliefs migrated across borders. So how they influenced activists in the US, 
how they influenced activists in West Africa. So that's a big part of what I'm trying to do with my dissertation and these digital tools uh, help with sort of getting at that question of nodes of ideas. So questions, the oriented questions that I came into this with um, are up there on the board. What can test mining or looking at using software to put in a whole bunch of um, treatises and lots of words and then uh, pulling out key themes? What can that tell us about sort of the weight of ideological nodes and groupings, clusters of ideas? Also, when did we start seeing rhetorical shifts, so shifts in the vocabulary on how slavery was attacked? We know, uh, historians have surmised about this for quite some time, that somewhere between the early modern and the modern period, the rhetoric shifts from sort of obligation, stewardship to God, duty to humanitarianism and altruism. So can we tell through uh, feeding in a whole bunch of anti-slavery treatises how that story plays out? Uh, in a particular social reform cause. Um, and then uh, finally, I was interested in seeing geospatial uh, relations with other activists around the globe, especially through international letters that folks in the Clapham group um, wrote and were in contact with various folks. Okay, very briefly, um, as I mentioned, text mining and analysis uh, was my focus, right? Uh, and then visualizing that. So the way I went about this is, first of all, gathering a whole bunch of data, which was uh, treatises, anti-slavery treatises, sermons. Uh, Hadi Trust was uh, uh, sort of the dominant database that I used uh, to pull together these things. Um, and then using in vivo, which has already been mentioned, uh, to uh, start uh, mapping out these ideas. So there's an autocode for, uh, portion of, uh, wow, I guess I should have made that full <laughs> slide, sorry. Um, uh, so there's an autocode feature which allows you to let the software determine what they think are the, uh, what it thinks is the main ideas. And so this is uh, an example. Uh, this is actually not an anti-slavery example. This is uh, Wilberforce's speeches before Parliament about uh, a bill to open India's missionaries. Uh, and so what are the words that sort of dominate, what are the uh, categories that dominate how he is arguing? Uh, well, you can see there uh, on the left, things like moral, uh, and there's a whole sort of network of ideas associated with that. Moral state, moral, de moral degradation, degradation, moral improvement. Um, Christians, human, uh, and so you get the sense that uh, on the surface, uh, Wilberforce is arguing heavily from the basis of Christianity. Let's take another example, or briefly, and I'm sorry, that got even uh, harder for me. Uh, so this is uh, a famous treatise that was published in 1823 uh, on anti-slavery, uh, on ending slavery in the British Empire. And so what are the key themes here? Well, again, we see things like moral and moral degradation, uh, but also a little bit different categories, uh, rights, features uh, largely lots of um, words related to humanity, right? Men, female, indecent, minds. Um, so uh, you get the sense here that Wilberforce is arguing more from the basis of humanity as sort of an overarching way, not necessarily uh, from defined Christian principles. You can see somewhat of the influence of enlightenment thought there. And finally, one last example of one of these hierarchy charts that helps sort of provide a grid to uh, Clapham ideas. This is taking various anti-slavery discourses that uh, Clapham figures wrote, so not just Wilberforce, but a couple of his lieutenants in the cause, Zachary McCulley and James Stephen, and what do we he see here? Key, key ways that sort of define uh, their public agenda is moral, uh, public, um, human rights, um, these are sort of the categories that appear over and over again uh, within their uh, discourses about uh, both anti-slavery and, um, I will say, about India as well. So it's helpful in directing my attention, at least initially, towards a uh, grouping of ideas. Now, moving on uh, with the sort of next phase, uh, the second phase of the procedure was to then, based on what I know, what it spit out, auto-coded, 
uh, to manually code five search terms uh, and then generate uh, visualizations through a program called Node Excel. All right, this is initially, so this is, uh, I can't remember exactly how many treatises are there, but you can see there's a fair, there's a number of treatises, there's also collections of correspondence, there is um, diaries, there are family prayers, uh, I just fed in a whole bunch of uh, their writings of different sort of genres using those five search terms that I've become convinced were uh, some of the dominant categories. And you get a whole bunch of relationships, it's challenging to interpret, not very useful. But then by uh, uh, changing the frequency, so paying attention to, so uh, a category only occurs you know, once or twice, I don't necessarily care so much about it, but if it occurs over and over and over again. So I set the frequency at a higher level in uh, Node Excel, and uh, that the same amount of data or the same uh, uh, sources uh, resulted in uh, this type of graph. So what does this show us? This is actually a little bit more useful. It shows us that, uh, for example, if you look at the top, is this a pointer? Yeah, okay, so if you look at this top area up here, uh, there is a strong relationship between duty and public in family prayers, right? So these are volumes of prayers that these families use. They authored themselves, they gathered them from liturgies that were out there, as well as in this source, Eclectic Notes, that is clerical discussions, discussions among clergy members associated with the group. Um, so that's really helpful to know, and they're not really pulling in, say, rights down here, right? So this is a very strong relationship here between duty and public, doesn't involve rights. Um, one other real quick example, uh, is this sort of triangle right here. I noticed there's three Wilberforce tracks right there, and then James Ramsey. He's sort of a, a forerunner of Wilberforce. He's active about 20 years prior, but influences uh, the Clapham sect. And we don't know exactly how much the level of influence was, uh, but this shows that at least with regards to these terms, public, moral, and human, uh, they're using very, very similar categories. All right, two final uh, quick thoughts, because I know I'm way past my time. So let me try to just uh, cover this very briefly. I then moved to uh, thinking about uh, Wilberforce's theological network. And so we have volumes of his correspondence that have now been published uh, and looking at the clergy figures that he corresponded with regularly. That's who all these uh, folks are. Um, so, uh, and that's, uh, I'll be honest, that this is something that needs to go be worked on a little bit more because obviously theology can happen uh, with non-clerical members and you could be having a discussion with a member of the clergy and have nothing to do with theology. So uh, that's a limitation right here that uh, I'll be going back and working to refine. But it revealed to me, for example, that the link between the Dean of Carlisle, Isaac Milner, there on the left, is really strong with Wilberforce, uh, which I had not recognized that before. Um, finally, uh, moving to the international dimension, uh, towards the end of the project, I started mapping out uh, where, sort of mapping Wilberforce's world internationally. Uh, and of the correspondence between 1795 and 1821 that we have, that's published, there's more out there, uh, there is a, the, the bulk, uh, small sample size here, but the bulk is going to the US, but also influences uh, with France, Haiti, and Poland. Um, so that uh, sort of turns me on to realizing which foreigners he's in contact with. All right, real briefly, uh, the, I think the biggest takeaways that I had from this was uh, revealing networks of ideas, because uh, without uh, surprise, that I wasn't aware of before. So rhetorical relationships that might exist between, say, anti-slavery discourses and liturgies or family prayers. Uh, and then how uh, those more theological pieces might be informing uh, activist pieces and vice versa. Uh, and then, of course, the transnational uh, dimension of it illuminates sort of their focus of efforts uh, globally. So once the slave, bill, the slave Trade Abolition Act gets through Parliament, they turn their focus to the U.S. to try to make sure slavery is ended in the U.S. as well. Um, it's helpful in uh, seeing that. Uh, so in, in summary, I think for someone coming from the discipline of history, things like this really help to make visible relationships and patterns in the past. Okay, like just 
Sid, uh, I'm from Indonesia. Let me start with, uh, I would like to draw Indonesia with my words, with my story. So when I came here, August, long time ago, <laughs> long, long time ago, uh, but like, it's really hot in Texas. And then like, my, my advisor like teasing me and asking me like, do you know what the difference between Indonesia, uh, between Texas and Hawaii? And I said, uh, no, it's quite different, I guess. I don't know what is the significant difference. And he says, like, he said, like, uh, Hawaii just has more water. <laughs> so I went back to Indonesia, and I, because Hawaii is similar to like Indonesia. Indonesia also went for Bali, like the Paradise Island, and then after I went back to Indonesia, uh, I pissed my, my advisor back. I, I asked, asked him, like, what is the difference between Hawaii and Indonesia? And he says, oh, that's similar. What is the difference? And I told him, like, Indonesia has more rednecks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, it's more, rednecks. it's more like farmers. Indonesia has a lot of farmers. So let, 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 let me, let me, let me, let me. By the way, that's, that's my, my, my advisor in, in the corner here. Oops. <laughs> Dr. Marx. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Indonesia, like, let, let me give you comparison with the uh, United States. Like, if, if everyone in the United States and you double it and move to Texas, Indonesia is still more dense than one, <laughs> like, in terms of population. So, so, so many people in Indonesia. Like, 2.7 the ratio. So if we multiply the whole United States population by 2.7 and move to Texas, every, everyone should move to Texas. That's how crowded it is in Indonesia. And then another interesting fact also like uh, one person in Indonesia on average has like two cell phones. So it's more amazing. <laughs> so that's why I try to apply like what I learned in, in, in computer, computer science, machine learning try to help poor farmer in Indonesia. So I uh, collaborate with uh, Indonesian government and Australian aid. Uh, we develop Android apps because a lot of cell phone in Indonesia, they have a lot of cell phone, at least two cell phones for them. So we try to use the cell phone to, to reach the poor farmer and then try to uh, educate them also, try, try to help them. So I try to give them like uh, usually poor farmer doesn't know what to uh, plant, what crop to plant for for the season. Like we we have like regular one for rice or corn, but in between like we we use like a uh, vegetable or horticulture. But that's one is like uh, more like they, they just like listen to what people say and then they they, they plant it and then. Uh, the price at, at the farmer farmer gets it's like very very low, so it's it's not it's not it's not really profitable for them. So I try to gather data, weather data, and uh, price data, market price data, and give them suggestion. Like try to predict in the next three months, like is it enough rainfall for the the crop, and how how how, how much is the price in the future. For so I use I use a uh, lot of machine learning like just says uh, neurofasi, fasi logic, and then like deep learning to help them to predict, give them suggestion what crop they should plant for the next season. So that basically that's that's the the, the, the project. So I try to illustrate with three layer here. So like like sandwich. Have like top part, bottom part, and then middle part. Right? Top part is like the front end, when you can see like when the cell phone, the, the cell phone application, like CPU, you can download it from from the store also, Android store or Google store. The CPU, and then they they have a uh, front end web also, east web, east east west seek Japanamera, that's a uh, Indonesian website. Uh, for selling seed for for the food farmer, and I I develop the back end based on the theoretical background that I get from 
from uh, my master degree and from my PhD. So today I will focus on little bit on the back end and then I will uh, focus on the visualization, especially for the website. Okay. So for 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 the server, I use uh, Ubuntu server in Amazon Light Light Sail, and then I use uh, micro micro vendor Python for the web server. For database, I use PostgreSQL and PostGIS. And I did some manual visualization at first using Visio, and that takes a lot of time because I have to show them like uh, they ask me like. Oh, I, I told them like there is not enough data. That's another problem in Indonesia. Like uh, the government try to push to get more data, so they, they put a lot of money to pay like a field operator in every island to get the data. But after, but like this one is more like incentive, so they give it like uh, only short period of time, and they expect like they keep continuing to feed the data. But then uh, like after no funding. No data. So, <laughs> that's that's another problem. So I have to show them like there is not enough data. We need we need we need more more data. So I try try to do manual visualization, and then after that, I I ask myself, uh, can I visualize better? I use static visualization using using Python. I will show. And in the summer in the summer, I learned from just uh, about JavaScript. So it's more interactive, more real time. Visualization. Uh, I learned also uh, using the WHO. Uh, that one is more easy, drag and drop, but like uh, when you try to put it into a web server and then try to grab uh, real time data, then you have to pay more or you have like have another license. I think, like this. So that's, that's one of the barriers. So why I moved uh, to the JavaScript. So during the summer, I learned about data and copyright. That's the most important things, I guess, that I learned. That I can get the uh, public domain data from from government statistics, and then also learn about uh, NASA data format because they change, because they keep improving their satellite, and then the data also like uh, getting getting more and more. The format is more and more sophisticated, so they try to cover all like future development of the data. So I learned I learned about NASA data also, and I learned about JavaScript and different library, and then I learned about uh, GIS software. So first we develop with just I develop uh, we develop a mockup. So this one is uh, from GIS software. We try I try to create like this is the visualization that I want to create. So I want to have like a heat map in Indonesia, like and then like uh, showing the price, the vegetable price in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So using this data, uh, using this visualization, people can see. Oh, if if there is no data, then it will be gray. A lot of gray area means like no data. They can see it much more better instead of I just seeing like like in here. Like first, I use this is using the visio. I use I use uh, cube data cube to show them like it's it's like point zero zero something right. So it's not enough data. I I need more data in order in order to create it more accurate. So uh, let's let's do some demonstration. So I hope it works. <coughs> So this is Python. This is the first one, the static one that I created. Uh, it works, but like uh, the data, you have to uh, after you get the data, you have to generate it first, generate the static page, and then put the static page into the web server and publish it, and everybody can see it. Then uh, with with JavaScript, you can do it in real time on the fly. This is like the JavaScript part, so it's more beautiful also. Thanks to Josh. Like I learned a lot about the uh, GIS, Geographic Information System. Indonesia is more complex than, than Texas, man. 
<laughs> like if I have text on that, and then it, like everything is square. In here, a lot of goals, a lot of curve. So it's 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 more interesting. Uh, I guess yeah. That's 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 all. That's all I have. So I learned a lot uh, about the visualization, how to present the, da the data better to both sides, to the stakeholder, and also to the partners. Thank you very much for your time. You want to talk a little bit about how this might be pushed out to the, the the farmer in uh, in Indonesia and how they might be able to to make use of this, given the the island <coughs> nature of Indonesia in that sense, or the, the so uh, let me show it here. Here, like you can choose the you can choose the vegetable like ah, maize, okay. red onion, kangkung, potato, cucumber. You can choose one of them, okay. and then you can see. Like the, the result. Oh, okay. So where, then, where it's where it's right, there. right. And so the result like the most expensive one in Indonesia is red chili. Uh -huh. So okay. Red chili is quite because we love spicy food. Uh huh. Uh huh. So you can see like the the price of chili in 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 many area in Indonesia. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you can download the Cipindo apps on the Google Store. Cipindo. Like special. They can just look it up and see what they should plan. Uh -huh. How many people have downloaded it? What? How many people have downloaded the app? Uh, I'm not sure. 20, 200, 2,000? Around 1,000, 10,000. But it's considered like still low compared to Indonesian population. Indonesian population is like number four in the world after after United States. Yes. Iwan, did you have any problems with the format of the data you received from the government sources versus what you, did you have to manipulate the data very much or, or uh, clean it up very much? Uh, from the government, yeah, that's that's another problem. Yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, because like they using uh, text messages, so mm -hmm. a lot of people write it wrongly, like missing one zero. Ah, okay. So, but that's that's relatively easy to. To, to spot like mm -hmm. because like okay. because uh, it's like ten thousand and one thousand for example and then you will know oh this is like anomaly yeah thank you and then uh, I talk also with the uh, United Nations United Nations have similar similar project uh, they have like plus like in Jakarta mm -hmm. so they have like crowdsourcing to gather price data so they use like uh, with with incentive, with money. Mm -hmm. So if, if 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 people update the data, they will give them like free mobile room for their cell phone, mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. their cell phone. Mm -hmm. But like that's also uh, the problem with the anomaly. Like people just put data to get the load instead of like is it really it accurate? Good afternoon. My name is Alicia McCartney and I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in the English department. Thank you all for coming today. I'm excited to share my research with you all remotely and I hope to be able to answer questions via Skype after this presentation. The title of my presentation today is Until the Sea Give Up Its Dead, Visualizing Shipwreck Narratives and Mining Religion in the Rothsay Castle Steam Shipwreck of 1831. But before we turn to shipwrecks, I'd like us to engage briefly in a thought experiment. Most of you probably recall hearing about Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, which, according to the New York Times, was one of the greatest aviation mysteries of all time. 
Flight 370 departed from Kuala Lumpur with 224 passengers and 17 crew members from 15 nations. Less than an hour after takeoff, the plane abruptly veered off course, made its last contact with radar, and disappeared. The loss of Flight 370 created a news firestorm and spawned a four-year multinational search. The final 470-page inquiry was released on July 30, 2018. Yet speculations about the causes of the crash continued to abound. Was it pilot suicide, a terror attack, structural flaws in the plane, even aliens? In the lack of conclusive evidence, the human need to narrate persists. But what if? Five to six airplanes like Flight 370 on average crashed every day. This thought experiment allows us to imagine the impact of shipwrecks on 19th century Britain. The century marked the massive technological shift from wooden ships to steamships. Yet even as this technological progress seemed to suggest human mastery over the elements, shipwrecks remained regrettably commonplace. In the four-year period from 1847 to 1850, the Times of London estimates around 8,500 serious wrecks, collisions, and shipping accidents an average of five to six serious wreck events per day. For perspective, there were only 14 airline accidents worldwide for the entire year of 2017. Coincidentally, the search for Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 actually uncovered not one, but two 19th century British coal ships that had sank to the ocean floor without a trace. During my prospectus review, one of the questions I received was, why shipwrecks? As part of my answer to that question, I wanted to visually communicate how shipwreck narratives in particular involved a diverse network of individuals. Shipwreck narratives, often based on the accounts of shipwreck survivors, are underread today, but they formed a wildly popular sector of 19th century print culture. My dissertation research seeks to recover the connections between these real shipwrecks and literary shipwrecks in 19th century Britain. Moreover, I examine how humans make meaning of shipwreck events through storytelling, particularly by imagining themselves in community with others and by using structuring forms offered by religion, such as prayer. Today I'll be discussing three specific ways that my Drive Summer Fellowship research fits into this larger dissertation project. My first project for this summer was to find a way to visualize how shipwrecks affected 19th century British culture and particularly to demonstrate how shipwrecks make visible both global and local networks or imagined communities. My second project is to visualize connections between texts that discuss a single shipwreck. And my third project is to examine how religious forms and practices provide shape and structure to shipwreck narratives. For the purposes of this summer project, I decided to focus on a single shipwreck, the 1831 wreck of the passenger steamship Rothsay Castle. I chose this particular wreck for my project primarily because there are a number of contemporary source texts that provide copious amounts of data to visualize. In fact, 36 years after the wreck, Household Words article notes that many wrecks have involved greater loss of life, but no wreck of the last century has perhaps been described more fully or from more points of view. The passenger steam packet Rothsay Castle ran aground on the Dutchman's Bank, only a few miles from its destination of Beaumaris, Wales. Of 141 passengers and crew on board, 116 perished. Although the exact causes of the wreck remained controversial, it was the perfect storm of human negligence and bad weather. The steamship was old, possibly unseaworthy, and never meant for sailing in the open ocean. A heavy storm arose, and the drunken captain refused to turn back in fear of losing profits. Using Tableau to visualize data from the most comprehensive account of the wreck, I created a map locating the approximate hometowns of every passenger on the steamship. What I wish to demonstrate through this project is that far from being a localized disaster, this wreck brought together a host of diverse individuals and an imagined community of sympathetic survivors. Among the victims was American Thomas Reddish from Cincinnati, Catholic priest Simon McCarthy of Dublin, Quaker Alexander Wheeler of Birmingham, Joseph, a crew member described simply as a boy of color, and a Portuguese gentleman referred to as de Souza, who had married an Englishwoman and lived as a universally respected resident of Liverpool. 
The small town of Bury, north of Manchester, was hardest hit. Only five out of 26 residents who left the boat survived. One of the limitations of this map is the lack of data about crew members' hometowns and any location data for unidentified bodies. I plan to improve this map by including a second layer indicating the wreck's aftermath in various locations over time. For example, places where shipwreck narratives were published and sold, locations where sermons were preached on the wreck, etc. Then Princess Victoria also commemorated the best poem written on the wreck with a medal. I would also like to include snippets from various shipwreck narratives about the individuals listed, including relevant information about how they lived and died. What I hope to demonstrate from this project is that even just a single wreck event brought together survivors from across the British Empire into a single print-mediated imagined community formed when reading a shipwreck narrative, such as the one I referenced by Joseph Adshead. Even family or friends of the victims who would never meet other survivors were reading their wreck accounts and involved in an event that Adshead directly imagines as compelling national and even universal sympathy. My second project was to visualize the network of texts written about the wreck. To do this, I compiled a corpus of 16 shipwreck narratives concerning the Rossay Castle wreck, published in the years afterwards, primarily sourced from Google Books and Hottie Trust. I was interested in how later authors selected material from earlier authors in a culture of cut-and-paste journalism, and which parts of the story they tended to focus on. This will come in in my third project, particularly. But my first project within this is to create a text network visualization, which I did by uploading my corpus using a code in Python 2.7 to determine the TF-IDF document similarity score, and also to find the top 10 unique words in each document. I then used Gephi to visualize the text network. What you can see from looking at this text network created by Gephi is that the narratives closest to the center in a triangle, those written by Morrison, Bransby, and Adshead, are the most similar. Text networking allowed me to determine that these three narratives were so similar because they drew from the same source text, which was an account by the Reverend J.H. Stewart, and it was not yet part of my corpus at the time. As one might expect, the outliers, the least similar accounts, were poems, such as the one by Kenway, and short newspaper articles, such as the Bell pieces, and these had the least resemblance to the rest of the texts. Finally, for my third major summer project, I sought to compare the texts within this corpus to see if there are any differences in the ways that they discuss religious forms, and particularly prayer. To do so, I used Juxta, which is an open source collation software developed specifically for textual scholars within the humanities to compare manuscript variants. You'll see this screenshot to your right and you'll notice that what Juxta does is highlights the text that is unique and leaves white the text that is shared between two documents. Coupled with close reading, this software pointed me to some fascinating discoveries, though in the interest of time, I'll share only one of particular interest. The Rossay Castle wreck involved many passengers who were religious. Most narratives relate how these passengers were praying after the wreck, Nevertheless, not all accounts portray these passengers' prayers positively. Some accounts do, for example, that of Joseph Adshead, who describes their prayers at length, quotes the words that were uttered, and praises them for their piety in the moments of shipwreck, while others completely gloss over the prayer. What I'm interested in, however, is who gives voice to one particular negative view of their prayers. This was voiced by a pilot who was on board at the time of the wreck. The pilot is shaken to the core by witnessing the people whom he calls the quality, highlighting his perception of class differences, engaging in, quote, praying and crying, end quote, linking prayers with both panic and lack of discipline at the moment of the wreck. I'm interested in who particularly tends to quote this negative assessment of prayer by the pilot and how they put it within the larger narrative. So Morrison, for example, quotes this negative assessment but it's in the context of blaming the pilot himself for not keeping his head in the disaster as opposed to the people who are praying and ostensibly perhaps doing more to save themselves. James Hughes Bransby, who is an interesting figure, is a sometime Unitarian minister, literary tinkerer, and possible kleptomaniac. His entry in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography is really fascinating. By contrast, he quotes the pilot in full, but side by side, he also praises the devout passengers for praying. 
Joseph Adshead, who leans more evangelical, selectively quotes Bransby's account of the pilot on page 40, but he kicks the derogatory remark about praying and crying to a footnote on page 295. But by 1880, about 50 years after the wreck, you see a shift in the ways that these prayers are discussed. An account in a more secular shipwreck anthology by F. Wimper foregrounds the pilot's negative remark about praying and crying and only mentions the prayers of the devout in a passing acknowledgement. This analysis demonstrates that there's no single way to narrate religion and shipwreck. The form of the shipwreck narrative has multiple affordances, either to include or exclude religion. Seeing how different texts tell the story of the same event has the potential to reveal texts' specific rhetorical aims and offer insights into the ways that religion is understood and features in these texts. I hope this sample of my research has demonstrated the potential and the power of combining a large corpus with both digital tools and traditional close reading. My goals in this project have been to recapture the human and print networks that become visible in these shipwreck narratives and to begin to understand the relationships between religious forms and narrative structure, and to draw scholarly attention to what these compelling stories reveal about 19th century culture, religion, and crisis. Thank you.